once again, my dear viewer and student, welcome to your favorite program, The Knowledge Quest. I am your teacher, Alex Sobara, and uh, I'll be taking you through the subject history and government. And uh, today we're still proceeding uh, with our discussion on the contacts between East Africa and outside world. In our previous discussions, we have explored on the contacts between East Africa and outside world up to the 15th century where we discussed about the Arabs coming to the East Africa and some of the early visitors like the Chinese, the Portuguese. And uh, we discussed on the early trade, the Indian Ocean trade, and you were able to look at the impacts, positive and negative. And then eventually we went ahead and discussed about the Portuguese and their coming to the East African coast. And uh, we were able to look at the reasons why they came to the East African coast. Uh, we saw how they were able to uh, entrench their rule to conquer and establish their rule in East African coast. And uh, eventually we saw on the decline, on how the Portuguese uh, declined on uh, ruling East African coast. Having looked that into detail in our last discussions, today I want us to discuss on the impact of the Portuguese rule. And uh, on the impact, we shall be looking on both the positive and the negative but in our case we shall begin with the negative impact and uh, we shall look at um, how this decline or the Portuguese rule negatively impacted on the people of East African coast and uh, largely uh, on their coming of to the East African coast so the first uh, negative impact is that this rule led to the decline of trade or other economic activities and uh, you realize that the Portuguese, as they came, they plundered. In other words, they uh, negatively impacted uh, the Indian Ocean trade, uh, disrupted the trade by imposing or imposition of heavy taxation. In some way, this discouraged uh, those communities or those participants who were taking place in the Indian Ocean trade. So that led to the decline, all right? And that, of course, you'll realize it has got economic impacts on the people. Those people who initially depended on their trade for their livelihood, who depend on the trade as their way of making, you know, ends meet, uh, it acted negatively. So it led to decline of trade and other economic activities. You realize that those economic activities which were related now to this trade, right? So uh, that in some way also... Uh, negatively impacted on the people of East Africa. Number two, uh, there was constant rebellions in their 200 years rule. Of course, that is wrong. That's not a good thing. All right? So having 200 years of constant rebellion, that means lack of peace. And of course, you know, where there's rebellion, people must be injured. People must suffer. Uh, things must be destroyed. So that leads us to understand that the Portuguese rule was ruthless. So the people did not enjoy uh, the Portuguese rule in the East African coast. Then number three, of course, out of these rebellions, there was loss of life, destruction of property as downs were looted and some were burnt down and crops were destroyed. These are very poor tactic. Uh, which was used by the Portuguese, all right? It was a very poor tactic which was used by the Portuguese, uh, which was clearing everything, cut down crops, destroy buildings, you know, uh, kill people. And as a result, that acted negatively uh, to the people. That's called a scorched earth policy tactic of war, which says go and destroy, clear, cut down, kill animals, confiscate them. And therefore, as a result, that also was negative. Number four, there was an inefficient administration. That is to mean the Portuguese administrators governed the coast poorly. So the administration was not very efficient. They, did not be able, they were not able to cover large areas. They were not able to entrench their rule in a good way. So there was inefficient administration people didn't really feel like the portuguese were carrying out their rule in the right way it was not efficient in any way and number five the local people did not cooperate with the portuguese it's, it's obvious that uh, if the rule of these people is going to be ruthless 
if it's going to be harsh, if they are going to apply tactics like scorch earth policy to, to kill people and to destroy property, therefore people will outrightly rebel. Therefore the local people did not cooperate with the Portuguese. And as a result, you realize that the local people did not gain in any way. And also the Portuguese ended up losing. That was negative. And then uh, there was also decline and ruin of coastal towns. There were towns which were burnt down. Okay? There were towns which were burnt down as a result of the way the Portuguese were administering their rule. Towns like Pati, we talked about Zanzibar, we talked about Sofala. Okay? Those towns, at some point, the Portuguese employed the scorched earth policy. And therefore, some towns, some old towns which were flourishing, doing well, attracting more investors, attracting more traders, declined and eventually were ruined completely. So you go, you will find that uh, there are some old towns which lay in ruins. In other words, people initially were there, but because the buildings were destroyed, because the structures were destroyed, people no longer live in those given areas. So that actually led to the decline and ruin of coastal towns. That decline and ruin of coastal towns. Number seven, their, their rule and disrupted Islam. The Portuguese undermined the Islamic religion. So, in other words, these people, as they were trying to establish their command, their role in that case, and their, uh, and their administration, they disrupted Islam. Because you remember, one of the reasons which motivated them to come was to counter the spread of Islam and instead spread Christianity. So as they're coming, their rule disrupts Islam from spreading further. And then further, they also undermined the Islamic religion. So in other words, they don't look at Islam as a good religion. They looked at it as a negative, from a negative uh, perspective. And that, of course, also was to the detriment of the people who had converted into Muslim, and of course also to the Christians who were being looked from a negative lens. Uh, number eight, there was introduction of guns and ammunition, which led to trans intensification of warfare and insecurity in the region. Of course, this means that uh, new weapons were introduced initially. There were weapons, but we can classify them as crude kind of weapons which were not as refined. So in this case, we are having introduction of guns, ammunitions. This led to intensification of warfare and intensity and um, sorry, insecurity in the region. So it means that uh, those people who had wrong intentions, for example, who wanted to steal, who wanted to loot, could use these weapons in the process. And therefore, that led to increase in insecurity. And of course, warfare, because now people had weapons, all right? And those weapons, as we can say, they were introduced by who? By the Portuguese. And therefore, that also uh, was a negative impact. And then we also have number nine, slave raiding was intensified. Okay? So there was intensification of slave raiding because you realize now, with the time, uh, slave trade became again popular. Of course, you realize they came and their main idea was to do away with slave trade. But over time, because they were unpopular, slave trade again came back. And therefore, it was entrenched and more people were captured as slaves. And of course, we saw earlier with slave, slave uh, raids, there was more suffering. Uh, there was more hatred between people and all that. Number 10, Though the Portuguese were the foreigners of Christianity in East Africa, their religion hardly made an, a mark on their coastal civilization, which was primarily Islamic. You realize they came with the idea, with the motive of spreading Christianity. But you realize the way the approach that they used was not very favorable. The people resisted. And therefore, that, that as a result, did not make any mark. So if you go to the coast largely, you realize that most of the people at the coast are Muslims. Why? Because the Portuguese never used the right technique or other tactic in as far as spreading their religion was concerned. So that is why today 
you realize that primarily the coastal areas are occupied by Muslims. And then number 11, the way of life of the local people, of course, refused to copy anything from the Portuguese. And uh, their dress and customs barely made an impact on the coastal people. That is how bad those people are viewed, to the point that even their culture was viewed as bad. You see, when we talk about culture, we're talking about the way of living, how they dress, how they eat, and all that. So the way of life that the local people refused to copy anything from the Portuguese because their dress and customs did not make any impact on the cost of people. So they thought this is just hogwash. It doesn't make any sense. So they did not copy anything. And then uh, number 12, let colonization. The coming of the Portuguese paved the way for the conquest of East Africa, East Coast Africa by other European powers in later years. Of course, we said they happened like the foreigners. They opened up East Africa and that encouraged other European powers to come in. Of course, you realize that as they were coming in, they were trying to outdo each other. These are some of the things we'll discuss in our later lessons in history. And you realize that some of the reasons why the Europeans entrenched their role in East Africa, there was that issue of nationalism. Some countries trying to appear superior than the other. So as a result, because the Portuguese came, other nations also came, other European nations, all right? to entrench their colonization. So that led to a colonization of East African coast uh, by other European powers in later years. So it's like they opened up East Africa for colonization. And then uh, having looked into that, let us now discuss on the positive. Of course, that was the negative bit of it. Let us see some of the more positive impacts of uh, the Portuguese rule uh, in the East African coast. So the first positive one is that uh, there was introduction of new crops. Crops which were initially not available in East Africa were introduced. And one of them is maize. And you realize today, maize is one of the staple food, uh, ugali. Of course, you get ugali from maize flour. So there was introduction of new crops such as maize, groundnuts, cassava, sweet potatoes, pineapples, Popos and guavas, all these were initially not, uh, of course, available in East Africa. But because of this, the coming of the Portuguese, they brought alongside their coming these crops, which are really good uh, for our, you know, our health and diet in that case. And then uh, there was uh, number two, enhancement of the development of the Kiswahili language. Okay, that means that Kiswahili was able to get more vocabulary. They were able to borrow from the Portuguese language and those uh, Portuguese words were Swahilianized, if there's a word like that. They were made into Swahili. So there are some words, for example, Meza is Portuguese, uh, which was made table in English, uh, Meza. Then we have Baruti, okay, which are dynamite. It was, it, this is Portuguese. Then in Vino, is Portuguese wine. So these are words which were added to the Kiswahili vocabulary as a result of the coming uh, of the Portuguese. Number three, they also influenced the architecture of the East Coast. So of course also there are, um, there are some designs of buildings along the East African coast which are of Portuguese in nature. Of course you go to the Fort Jesus uh, you look at the Vasco da Gama pillars, areas around Malindi, Mombasa, and um, uh, Kual, all those areas. If you go to those areas, you realize that there are some buildings which uh, they borrow the designs from the Portuguese architect. Of course, apart from the Arabic, uh, there are those architects which were follow, borrowed from, uh, largely from the Portuguese. Number four, there was promotion. There was promotion of good relations between East and Coast, East Africa, of course, and India. Right. So there was that promotion of good relation. People began to relate well, uh, as far as you know. They relate. Of course, you remember we said that India acted as the headquarter. It acted as the headquarter for the Portuguese. So there was that boosting of the relationship because they had something in common. There was something in common that both of them were under the control of, um, of the Portuguese. So in some way, it promoted 
good relations between the East Coast and India. So there was that communication, traveling to India and back and all that. Um, there was also number five, opening up of the East Coast to other European powers, such as Britain and Holland. This, if we look at it from the positive lens, in the sense that it opened up East Africa for more trade. Of course, you don't want to look at it from the negative side, which is colonization, but it is opening up East Africa to other European powers like Britain and Holland, which boosted the trade and good relationships, international relations between uh, East African coast and the other European powers like Britain and Holland. And then number six, another positive, uh, positive effect is that there was introduction of farmyard manure. Very important because this one is uh, good as far as agriculture is concerned. Yeah, so it, um, it introduced, there was introduction of farmyard manure which improved in some way, it improved, uh, you know, the, the, the products and the crops which were, you know, um, cultivated then. Number seven, which is also positive in a way, that a few Africans were converted to Christianity, all right? So uh, the, those Africans who uh, appealed, who got appealed to the religion of Christianity, uh, so they were able to build a few churches and converted a few Africans to Christianity. Of course, we said their approach was wrong. Their intentions were good, but their approach was wrong. They had intentions of converting people to Christianity, but in their approach, they used harsh, ruthless, and brutal means, and that is why they were not very successful uh, to convert many. But we say there were a few Africans who were converted to Christianity, and as a result, they've built few churches and converted a few Africans uh, to Christianity. So that's what you can say about uh, uh, the positive impact of uh, the Portuguese rule in East Africa. So in 1698, having looked at the, the Portuguese rule, in 1698, the Omani Arabs come, and we talked about this initially, how the Portuguese declined. So they come and capture for Jesus and put it under siege. So after the capturing of that, the Omani Arabs begin to establish their rule in East African coast. So after the fall of Fort Jesus in 1698, the East Coast of Africa came under the Omani rule. So Omani rule, these are Arabs from Omani, right? These are Arabs from Omani. So that's why I call them Omani Arabs or the Omani rule. Oman is a small country in Arabia on the Persian Gulf. Okay, so if you go to your atlases or to your maps, look at Oman in Arabia, look at the Persian Gulf, you'll be able to see Oman. So that is, those are the Arabs who came after the Portuguese. So after the Portuguese have been captured and for Jesus is taken under the Omani, so they come uh, from Arabia in the Persian Gulf. So the Imam of Oman became the ruler of the East African coast, right? So this change of guard. Initially, we say it was uh, the viceroy, the Portuguese viceroy, the captain general, who was based in, um, uh, in Goa in India. But in this time now, the imam of Oman became the ruler of the East African coast. And the imam could exert his authority over uh, coastal directly, number one, due to the distance from Oman to the East African coast, he was able to do it directly, all right? He was able. I mean, he was not able, sorry, he was not able to exert, all right? I beg your pardon. The imam who could not exert his authority over the coastal towns directly due to distance. So the distance from Oman to East Africa was really big. Number two, there was the issue of civil strife or wars in Oman. Then number three, there was threat of Persian invasion. The Persians were threatening to invade Oman. So as a result of these reasons, the Imam was not able to exert his authority directly. That means by default that his authority was exerted indirectly, right? So let us see how this authority uh, was exerted. Therefore, administration of the East Africa was entrusted to various local Arab 
governors. All right? So because of those reasons which we've seen, he was not able to carry out the administration directly. And as a result, he entrusted okay, the authority to various local Arab governors. For example, in Mombasa, we had the Mazrui family. So from the Mazrui family, we had a governor. Then in Lamu, we have the Nabahani family. So Omani rule was unpopular as that of their predecessors. Of course, the predecessors in that case, we talked about the Arabs who came earlier. Then we had the Portuguese. Now it was unpopular as that of the predecessors. Now in this case, it's the Portuguese. It was not very popular. Some governors were harsh and ruthless. Do you know something? That harsh and ruthless is a common word which we saw when the Portuguese were ruling East African coast. So they're also becoming unpopular because of their approach and tactic. Harsh and ruthless. So we move on. Uh, therefore, there was also struggle for power. There was struggle for power that was mostly between the Mazrui family and the Imams of Oman. So as far as the Oman was using the Mazrui family, there was power struggle, trying to see who can control East African coast. So uh, Oman, as a country, was ruled by the Yorubi sultans. Okay, this is some bit of interesting history. So it was ruled by Yorub Yorubi sultans. Yorubi, this is like some form of sub-tribe in Oman. Okay, so sultans from the Yorubi sub-tribe ruled Omani up to 1741 when a new ruling dynasty was enthroned in Omani. That is the Busaid dynasty. Okay, so I want you to follow this history because it's important for you to understand how it is important for you to understand how this rule was ensued. So initially, Omani as a country was ruled by the Yorubi sultans up to the year 1741. Then a new ruling dynasty was put on the throne or enthroned. That is the Busaid dynasty, which brought, brought struggle for domination of the East Coast between Mazrui and Busaid families, which lasted for 100 years. So the power struggle we are seeing happening in coast, East African coast, is mainly between the Busaid family, the Busaid are back in Oman, all right, and the Mazrui, sorry, there's a, there's a typo here, the Mazrui who are uh, in, in East African coast. And this power struggle lasted 400 years from 1741 to 1840, 400 good years. And then you realize that uh, there were reasons which led for, to these conflicts. So we want to look at the, the reasons for the conflicts between Omani and al Busaid or the Busaidi family. So these are some of the reasons. Number one, there was the desire of the Omani sultans to control coastal towns, including Mombasa, and therefore, or thereby by extension, to gain control of the East African coast trade. All right? So there was that desire. Initially, uh, the Omani wanted to control the coast town. Of course, these coastal towns were controlled by the Mazrui, but now they wanted to control that, and that brought struggle. Number two, the Mazrui governors wanted to be independent. Remember we say the Omani Arabs have come and they're trying to use Mazrui as a way of administering their rule, and that did not augur well with them. Therefore, they wanted to be independent and in, uh, put their rule independently without being monitored by the Omani Arabs. Then Mombasa, had fought hard against the Portuguese and had no desire to be ruled by another foreign power, all right? And of course, I've told you again, the Omani Arabs were unpopular. So because the predecessor, who were the, um, the Portuguese, were unpopular, they were harsh, ruthless, and the rule was bad, the Mombasa people, again, did not want to go or to undergo the same experience. And therefore, as a result, there was conflict, trying to fight for freedom, and independence. Then the, Sultan, the sultans of Oman wanted to gain a monopoly of the coastal trade. That's another reason. They wanted to control the trade uh, without necessarily being uh, interfered by the Mazrui uh, family. So those are the reasons 
which are actually led to uh, the conflicts uh, between the Oman um, Arabs and the Mazrui. So in this case, we look at the Busaidi family and the Mazrui. Busaid are Oman Arabs. The Mazrui are the coastal Arabs who are in, uh, in the East African coast. So we're going to have a short break and then we'll come back and proceed and uh, see how the Omani Arabs was established and how this conflict came to an end eventually. Uh, see you shortly after the break. Welcome back after the break and uh, we are on with our discussions on uh, the establishment of the Omani rule and I you've given a brief discussion about the Omani rules and uh, Omani and you've said Omani is a country. So we're talking about Omani rule. These are Arabs who came from that country to control East African coast. And you've said that um, after giving a brief history about the Omani Arabs, we see there is some form of conflict ensuing between the Al Busaidi family and the Mazrui family. Al Busaidi back in Oman and the Mazrui back in East African coast. And these are the reasons that we gave which led to the conflict. Number one, he said the desire of the Omani sultans to control the coastal towns like Mombasa. Number two, we said the Mazrui governors wanted to be independent. Number three, we said Mombasa people had hard feelings against the Portuguese. You know, they had experienced the Portuguese rule, which was really bad. And therefore, they wanted to be independent from another foreign power. Then also, number four, we see the sultans of Oman wanted to gain a monopoly. They wanted to control the business without necessarily uh, having uh, to involve any other uh, power. So there was there are some milestones of this struggle between Said Said, all right, and the Mazrui governor. So Said Said, these are money money ruler back. In Omani. That's very important. So we have to understand this. Let's see. This will give us a good history. So in 1806, Sayyid Said ascended to the throne in Oman. Okay? In 1806, as Sayyid Said moved or ascended to the throne in Oman and continued with the struggle. So the struggle didn't end with the change of governor. So as Sayyid Said is coming, the struggle continues. He built a fortress in Mombasa and ordered all towns to recognize the power of Oman. So he built a fortress in Mombasa and instructs that the Mombasa people and all the people to recognize him and the power of Oman. In 1800, 1800 to 1807, Mazrui, so you see this power struggle, Mazrui extended their rule from Malindi to Pangani. Of course, that is coastal still. Uh, in 1807, Mombasa, uh, took over part. In other words, you are saying Mombasa was came, the Mazrui family took over a uh, party. In 1810, Mombasa attacked Lam. So we're talking about these two states struggling, this past struggle there between Busaidi and uh, the Al Busaidi and talking about the Mazrui. And I say it said there. So in 1814, Mazrui governor appealed to the British for aid. So there is a power struggle still going on. And Mazrui is appealing for the British to come in and assist him in their struggle against the Omani Arabs. Very important. Let us proceed. Um, so what happens? In 1817, Said Said liberated Pate from Mazrui rule. So you see there is also taking up, fighting and taking up of states. So Said Said liberated Pate from Mazrui rule. He liberated Pemba and Brava from Mazrui rule. So Said Said is taking entrenchment. Bit by bit, he's taking over power from Said Said. I mean from uh, Mazrui. And then Said Said gained control of Buyan Islands. In 1827, Said Said unsuccessfully attempted to subdue Mombasa. Of course, Mombasa now was the headquarters for the Mazrui family. So in 1827 he tried, 1827 he tried, but was not able to. 1829, Said Said 
paid another visit to the coast. And in 1837, he conquered Mombasa. Therefore, he murdered all the leading Mazrui. So you're saying that there's a this past struggle, and the only way through which Said Said is able to entrench his rule is by carrying out what you call murder. So he kills all the leading Mazrui leaders. Okay, so like the the family imams were killed. So in 1840, Said Said shifted his capital from Muscat in Oman to Zanzibar. All right, so Zanzibar now is closer. Zanzibar is closer. He shifts his rule, his headquarters from Oman. In Zan and brings it to Zanzibar. So the question we'll ask ourselves, we want to answer this question, is um, uh, reasons why Said Said shifted his capital uh, to Zanzibar from Oman. Okay. So why did he shift his capital from Oman to Zanzibar in 1840? So number one, Look at these points very effectively, discuss them so that you'll be able to remember them. It's very important. So number one, he wanted to control East African coast, okay, more effectively. Why? Because Zanzibar was a bit closer. So he wanted to control East African dominions more effectively, right? Because we said, um, initially, as you can remember, we talked about Oman being so far away, the distance from Oman uh, to you know, Zanzibar and East Africa was far. So he wanted to control East African dominions more effectively. And therefore, he opted to transfer it from Muscat and brought it to Zanzibar. All right? Number two, Zanzibar was centrally located. That is of uh, strategic importance. When talking about um, the location, that is of strategic importance. So Zanzibar was centrally located. Its position was ideal for trade with the mainland and with Mombasa to the north. So if you go to the, um, you go to the atlas or to the map, try to look at where uh, Zanzibar is located and look at Muscat is where Muscat is located. So you realize the two are different, right? So they are differently located. Zanzibar is more of centrally placed as opposed to Muscat, which is far out of uh, East Africa. So that is number two, why he transferred his uh, capital. Number three, Zanzibar had cool, pleasant climate. Okay? It had cool, pleasant climate compared to Muscat, which was hot and dry. So the climate there was favorable for survival, for living, for carrying out agriculture, as we shall see. So Zanzibar had a cool and pleasant climate. So you see, yeah, it's by default that most of us want to live in a good climate. So that's the same applies here. So uh, Said said, so this place to, had, uh, to have a cool, pleasant climate, as opposed to Muscat, which was hot and dry. All right, then number four, Zanzibar had sufficient rainfall and fertile soils. That is also important. We're talking about, um, talking about rainfall and fertile soils. It's important for issues of agriculture. And especially, the Omani Arabs were mostly specialized in cultivation of cloves. Right? So Zanzibar had sufficient rainfall and fertile soils favorable for agriculture, especially in the cultivation of uh, cloves. Right? So having, having looked at that, we look at uh, the last reason here. Its position as an island, right? It was an island. It was uh, the position of Zanzibar is surrounded by water. So that means that if an enemy will have to come and attack people in Zanzibar, they'll have to use water. And that means it's easier to do what? To safeguard, to spot an enemy from away. So this position as an island made it easy to safeguard because it was easier to see at the enemy from far and therefore protect um, the headquarter from any invasion of uh, enemies. Number seven, Zanzibar had good harbors, which with deep waters and could be an international port for, uh, for, for, of all large vessels. In other words, what you're saying here, that it had good harbors. And we talked about this initially, that harbors are important for docking. 
right, or anchoring of ship. So this means that uh, with these deep waters, it could be an ideal place for international or an international port for, for trade to dock in large vessels, uh, which would encourage more trade still. Uh, number seven, Zanzibar had fresh and clean water. Okay, so fresh and clean water for sustenance of uh, human beings, for sustenance of, uh, of, 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 of uh, life in that in general. So it had fresh and clean water. Uh, lastly, but not least, he found out that Zanzibar was of immense strategic importance. It was of immense strategic importance, which he could use to do out, number one, international trade. So he realized this place was strategically important for international trade. Number two, for long distance trade with the interior. So it was easier also to carry out trade with the interior communities in these uh, 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 area that is a uh, strategic importance that is Zanzibar so having looked at that uh, we now look at the development of plantation agriculture so having moved to Zanzibar like we have seen now it's easier to control the East African coast it's easier to control all the activities taking place and therefore he thought having controlled East African coast why not venture still? So he ventured still more and carried out what referred to as plantation agriculture. And uh, plantation agriculture is usually defined in terms of agriculture planting one type of crop on a large piece of land. That's referred to as plantation. So uh, Said Said developed plantation agriculture in the coast. And some of the factors which enabled him uh, to... Uh, establish and develop plantation agriculture in the East African coast include the following. Number one, Zanzibar had fresh and clean water. Of course, water is important in the aspects of irrigation, right? So crops require water which is fresh, not salty. So very few crops survive in salty or saline environment. But this, in this case, you are realizing that Zanzibar had fresh and clean water. So that was important uh, for purposes of growing crops and irrigation. Number two, the reason why he established development or um, plantation agriculture is East Africa had great agricultural potential. All right? So in other words, looking at East African coast, the place was potential agriculture looking at it at the land it was vast land looking at what we shall be looking at the fertility it was fertile so there was potential okay so he established his own club farms in zanzibar also east africa was particularly suited to large-scale crop growing why because of the availability of large pieces of land i said plantation farming is usually growing one type of crop usually over a large piece of land. So East Africa was particularly suited to large-scale crop uh, growing. And that one we said is because of the availability of large tracts of land which were unsettled or unoccupied in that case. And then, of course, with uh, establishing plantation farming, he encouraged settlers from Oman and Zanzibar to settle in Mombasa, Lamu, Malindi and Pemba to plant cloves. So in other words also, there's the aspect of establishment of settlements. So the, the plantation farming would encourage, by default, the coming of the Arabs to live in those places, of course, to carry out agricultural activity. So in other words, it was a way, it was a tactic of encouraging more uh, Omani Arabs to travel from Omani and to come to... Um, East Africa. So number five, number five, agricultural activities were intensified from the year 1840. Okay, it was based on crops such as rice, maize, millet, beans, sesame, sorghum, coconut, and grains as well as three crops such as mangoes, citrus fruits, and cashew nuts. So these agricultural activities were intensified from 18. 
140. So he encouraged the establishment of plantations around areas of Malindi and Takaungu. So for those ones probably who have been privileged enough to travel to the coast, we talk about areas around Malindi, talk of areas ar around Takaungu. Those are some of the areas where we had plantations of mangoes, plantations of citrus fruits, and cashew nuts. And of course, in some areas, you'll be able to see sisal when you move up from Tuapa as you move all the way to Vipingo and all that, those areas. So those are examples of our crops which uh, he encouraged to be grown around those areas. Uh, so the establishment of a plantation economy intensified slave trade. How that be? That is possible. That happened as a result of the need for labor. There was need for labor uh, for people who could work in the farms. There was need for people who could harvest. There was need for people who could carry out um, irrigation. So therefore, it meant that the establishment of plantation economy had some negative impact on the local people that most of them were captured and taken as slaves to provide labor in the plantations. So you see again, this plantation agriculture, as much as we may view it as positive, it also had its negative. So you see now we are introducing slave trade. As a result of plantation agriculture, there is introduction of slave trade. So causes of the slave trade causes of intensification. Of course, look here. I want you to note we say that uh, the establishment of plantation economy intensified slave trade. All right? So that begs the question, what were the causes of slave trade? And therefore, we say, number one, increased internal demand. Increased internal demand for slave labor on clove plantations in areas like Zanzibar, Pemba, Malindi, and Mombasa, all right? So slave trade again comes back. Remember the Portuguese came with the idea of doing away with slave trade. But with the coming of the Omani Arabs, with the establishment of plantations by Sayyid Said, slave trade is brought back. So the first reason we say there was increased internal demand for the slaves to provide labor on cloth plantations in those areas. Number two, Slaves were needed in French sugar plantations on the islands of Reunion and Mauritius. All right? So you realize that um, there were those French who had captured some areas in those islands. We have islands of Reunion and, of course, in Mauritius. So they established sugar plantation. Of course, we're talking about plantation agriculture. So you're seeing here again the sugar plantation. Okay? So slaves were also needed by in French sugar plantations on the islands of Reunion and Mauritius to provide labor. So there is uh, the demand locally rising, or local demand, and then there's also international demand in those areas. Number three, there was demand for slave porters, especially in the ivory trade and transportation of agricultural goods. Talking about porters, we are referring to people who could carry, all right? People could carry those uh, commodities. So uh, ivory trade, those ivories from animals like elephants and tusks and all that were to be carried by people. And those people were not any other people but slaves. So there was demand for slaves, for porters, especially in ivory trade and transportation of agricultural goods, which of course we say were got from the plantation agriculture. And then uh, number four, we realized there was also slave demand in Arabia to work as domestic workers or servants and soldiers. So there were those who were captured and taken to Arabia to provide domestic labor. So they were to work as domestic workers, servants, and some were to work as soldiers to provide probably uh, security. Uh, also number five, the Portuguese, again you see the Portuguese are appearing. The Portuguese needed slave labor in where? Their plantations in Brazil. So plantation agriculture, again, as much as it was good for the development of economy, it wasn't very good for the local Monainchi because it meant that most of them would be captured as slaves to work in those plantations for little or no pay. So 
Portuguese needed slave labor in their plantations in Brazil. Um, having looked at that, let us look at some of the methods which were used in obtaining slaves. The method, this will mark, actually this will be the end of our discussion today. After discussing of these methods, we'll be able to see on what we can do uh, in our next discussion. So the methods which were used in obtaining slaves included the following. One, slave raids. Okay? So these were captured in inter and intra. What we're talking about inter is between one community and another or in the same community. So we say those captured in inter or intra community warfare were captured as slaves. So if we say we have community A and in that community is a conflict, that those people will be captured within that community. Or if there is a conflict between community A and B, that is inter, okay, inter-community warfare. So those people within a given community will be captured and will be taken as slaves. So we say those were slave raids. They were raiding for slaves. You remember we said this one also was somehow an economic activity in some communities. So slave raids and human beings were raided as uh, commodities. That's really sad, but yes, it happened. So uh, slave raids. Number two, chiefs sold criminals to slave traders. Okay? So the chiefs in this case, it means that um, there were those people who were involved in some crime of some nature and they were captured by the chief. So what the chief could do, he will take those criminals uh, to the slave traders and sell them at a stake or at some value and say, okay, this slave probably one dollar, okay? Of course, uh, that's an example. So chiefs uh, sold criminals to slave traders. Then there was also the issue of kidnapping of children and lone travelers to slave raiders. This meant that those people were probably walking along the path alone in the evening, early in the morning, during the day, those could be captured and they could be sold as slaves. Lastly, in this case, but not least, that those who are defenseless and helpless people were taken as captive. Those people were defenseless. They, they never knew how to defend themselves. They were captured and taken as slaves. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that marks the end of our discussions today. And uh, we are going to proceed when we meet our next lesson. We will look into uh, more of uh, the factors of abolishing slave trade and all that and eventually uh, look at the Omani Arabs and how they established and ended their rule in East Africa. So you keep safe and uh, let's meet in honest uh, discussion. Goodbye.